How are we going to deal with that? And how do these technologies seep into not only the content of it, our education, but what are our responsibilities in training people for a world in which decisions are being made in really radically different ways? And I certainly could not think of a better person to begin this than Dr. Jahanian, who commands immense respect at the Association of American Universities, the top group of research universities that meets twice a year, as he said it, for therapy <laughs> sessions. Um, <laughs> not that any of you would be responsible for that need for therapy, uh, but he's a respected voice partly because of the extraordinary experience he brings spent three years uh, leading the NSF Directorate on Computer and Information Sciences and Engineering, was provost of uh, Carnegie Mellon before he became president, was chair of computer science at the University of Michigan. He, he does have a connection to the great state of Texas, having received his doctorate at the University of Texas at, at Austin. We could not be more grateful Thank that you, you have much. so graciously agreed to tear yourself away from the daily joy of being on your campus and to share your thoughts with us Thank on this subject. Much. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Farnham to Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's wonderful to be with you this afternoon, President Liberon. Thank you very much uh, for your kind uh, introduction. Um, I had the pleasure of spending the day with a number of your faculty colleagues and, and your leadership team. It was invigorating. It was wonderful to spend the day um, just talking about all sorts of issues, including some of the issues that I'm going to raise. Again, Thank you for your hospitality and this warm welcome, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, as uh, 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 President Liberon mentioned, uh, I have a deep connection to the uh, state of Texas. I'm an alum of uh, UT Austin, where I spent my youth in San Antonio and then in Austin for many, many years. It's always good to be back in this wonderful state, and I have great memories of watching the Longhorns play Rice in Southwest Conference uh, many, many years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and I have to tell you that also I'm a big fan of your uh, uh, band, the marching band, which is <laughs> fabulous and quite entertaining, as all of you know. Um, again, it's good to be here. Uh, thanks to Moshe for this invitation. As Moshe mentioned, he and I have known each other uh, for a few decades. Uh, both of us worked at IBM Research. She was on the West Coast, I was on the East Coast. I'm a little younger than Moshe, uh, but I do want to take a moment to congratulate Moshe and all of you uh, across Rice as you launch uh, this important initiative to examine uh, the intersection of technology, culture, and society. As uh, President Liberon just mentioned, uh, this is such an important and, and timely topic for uh, humanity and for society and Rice continues to be a world-class institution and this latest development uh, will certainly increase your impact uh, on our changing and continually evolving world. This initiative underscores the importance of research and education amid today's unprecedented advances we see in technology. So this afternoon what I hope to do is to talk a little bit about the changing role of higher education in this age of disruption, with a particular focus on the way computation and data are un underpinning these um, changes. To begin, I think we all recognize that we are in the middle of a global transformation uh, that's catalyzed by rapid uh, acceleration in digital technologies, uh, unprecedented access to data, digitization of information, uh, increase in computational resources and of course the role of automation and AI. The scale, the scope and the pace of these advances are unprecedented uh, in human history. Uh, in fact, let's consider for a moment what we have seen just over the last 10 years. We could have scarcely imagined uh, some of the innovations that are possible today. Uh, imagine by integrating biomedical, clinical and scientific data we can predict the onset of diseases, identify unwanted drug interactions, and automate diagnosis and personalize therapeutic. Uh, imagine that by coupling 
roadway sensors, traffic cameras, and individual uh, GPS devices, we can reduce traffic congestion and generate significant savings in time in fuel efficiencies and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, imagine that by accelerating, uh, but accurately I should say, predicting natural disasters such as hurricanes and tornadoes, we can employ life-saving and preventative measures that mitigate their potential impact. Or just imagine that how we can use now biometrics and unconstrained fi facial recognition techniques uh, to correlate disparate data sources to enhance public safety. And before you say anything, I completely recognize that there are significant privacy issues and related issues, some of which we'll get to. Or by accurately predicting natural disasters such as hurricanes and tornadoes, we can employ life-saving and preventative measures to mitigate their impact. As I said, and I moved back. Okay, here we go. Or uh, when it comes to uh, autonomous technology, we can have our cars drive us safely and securely, uh, potentially mitigating the danger of traffic accidents that's caused by uh, human error. And of course, by cataloging data from millions of photos and videos posted on social media from conflict areas, and that has been done, we can move uh, rapidly to investigate and understand the human impact of conflicts, disas disasters, uh, not to mention political violence. Uh, you can imagine by integrating emerging technologies such as AI-enabled learning techniques and inverted classrooms, we can achieve personalized and much, much more powerful outcome-based education. All of this, of course, has happened because of unprecedented advances that we've seen in a number of emerging technologies that are catalyzed by three major trends. One, without spending a lot of time in it, is uh, the fact that we've seen unbelievable uh, exponential, essentially, increases in the computational connectivity and storage capacity of uh, digital technologies. The second one has to do with the role of digitization, access to unprecedented amount of data that's available, and increasingly sophisticated algorithms, including machine learning and deep learning algorithms, that allow us to analyze data, predict certain kinds of behavior. And finally, um, the uh, other trend that's extremely important is over the last 20 years, what we've seen is ubiquitous deployment of sensors that have been enabling smart systems all around us in all sorts of infrastructure and in our physical environment. By melding this cyber and physical world together, we're able essentially to deeply integrate computation, communication, and control into the physical system with some amazing um, capabilities and, uh, and potential applications. The power of digital technologies and the innovation that we see is uh, a, 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 a not only is increasing exponential power, but it also is much more than just being additive. Uh, each development becomes a building block uh, for future innovations. So these progress or advances don't just accumulate, they multiply. And I'll say a few words about that in a moment. Just consider the gap that used to take, between milestones, used to take decades potentially. Now we see it in a matter of uh, months and little as uh, a few weeks. Um, in some cases, computational technologies are outstripping the performance of even the most experienced humans, and in other cases, they help to augment our physical or cognitive capabilities. Just imagine the advances we're seeing in speech recognition, in computer vision, in facial recognition, in robotic surgery, in natural language understanding, and the list goes on and on. Well, uh, we're now facing a future that, that, it, that we're impossible now seems achievable. And we now, well, we can see ourselves to be only a few years away from groundbreaking discoveries that I in ways that, for example, how healthcare is delivered and understanding the human brain, in how we envision essentially smarter connected cities, in how we make global decision making, or in fact how we embrace 
uh, automation and, and transportation. So I know at some level I am telling you things that you see and you experience every day. And a final point about this is there is a broad recognition that these advances are underpinning our economic prosperity and global security. They accelerate the pace of discovery in just about every field of inquiry and are, of course, crucial to achieving many of our uh, societal priorities. So this is all great and sounds wonderful. But we know also that technological innovations have always disrupted the status quo and underpinned, essentially, dynamic economic change. The challenge we have with, uh, today is that, however, digital technologies not only are unprecedented in their scale, scope, and pace, and the impact, they are disrupting many markets and industries, and, and what we're also seeing, the ubiquitous adoption at breathtaking pace and accelerating the economic impact. Um, so the question really is that these advances, of course, we're seeing uh, uh, at, a, at an unprecedented pace, but are we at an inflection point? The truth is that um, a number of uh, uh, thought leaders have been thinking about that while the unemployment, for example, is at a historically low level, there is growing concern and anxiety around the future of work, in particular in the context of automation and advances that we see in technology. If we, in fact, listen carefully, some of the anxiety that we hear about the future of work are cultural, others are economic. And in fact, at the time when investment in uh, some of the innovation has, has declined, it's also at, at the same time that we see a significant, essentially, change in the definition of work. Estimates are, just as an example, that 60% of the US labor workforce is now paid hourly wages. Another example, between a fifth and a third of Western labor market is already engaged in independent work or essentially uh, 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 gig economy. Some argue that the age of automation making, the labor, incre making labor increasingly uh, dispensable. And uh, maybe that there's a lot of truth to that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the fact is that uh, uh, while these contemporary concerns may seem new to us, Economic history teaches us that they're actually not new. Uh, today, we're living in an age where many respected scholars and experts are raising alarms that next wave of technological innovations could bring with it an explosion of joblessness. In fact, going back to the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution, the first Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, the same concerns were, of course, expressed. Back, in fact, in the 1950s and 60s, there was particularly intense concerns about the, uh, the, the, uh, the wave of automation that was taking over factories. And in fact, Martin Luther King raised concerns about this. LBJ, in fact, uh, 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 impaneled a blue ribbon uh, commission to study the potential impact of automation on uh, industry. In fact, about 50 50 years after John Kennedy expressed his concerns about how machines could potentially put people out of jobs, President Obama, in 2016, during his farewell address to the nation, said, and I quote, the next wave of economic dislocation won't come from overseas. It will come from the relentless pace of automation that makes a lot of good middle class jobs obsolete. Well, both history and economic theory tells us that while we have seen historically low unemployment for the past uh, several decades, in fact, um, although there have been period where they've seen a jump in unemployment, but the average unemployment over the past several decades has been fairly low. It tells us that there is a rising inequality that's created by industrialization technology. And the history tells us that that often essentially rising inequality followed by strong forces of equalization as the society becomes richer and more people move into the middle class. That's been actually the history if you look back over the last 100 plus years. While automation 
uh, the, the wave of automation that we see over the past half a century did not bring mass unemployment. It did bring an explosion of inequality. In fact, the graph that you see up there, and it's been shown in a lot of different uh, uh, presentations, and it's actually been extended to 2015 and more recently beyond 2015, it shows that in fact it breaks down wage trends over, the, over time by education level. And it shows that a chasm has opened up uh, between the least educated and the best educated in the country. In fact, our most educated citizens have continued to see their wages rise robustly since the early 1970s. And uh, the less educated citizens have seen their real income fall since the early 1970s. That applies to when men as well as women. That also applies to, in fact, to high school versus two-year colleges versus bachelor degrees and, and so on. In fact, uh, 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 what many would regard as a middle class standard of living is increasingly seems to be out of reach for a large fraction of our society. The past half a century of advances in technology has definitely created a pronounced skill bias in our economy. And in fact, over the last 30 years, the inequality gap has been growing with, of course, the emerging technologies that are just around the corner in AI and automation. It is likely that this gap is going to grow. Another graph that I want to use to highlight the uh, inequality that I'm referring to has, uh, was actually published in a June 2018 um, cover article of Atlantic. It's a wonderful article. It's well-researched. And essentially what it shows is that uh, you see that over the last, again, 50-plus uh, years, the top 0.1% have seen essentially, uh, have been the big winners, if you will, in the growing concentration of wealth, uh, as I mentioned, over the half century. But what's intriguing that is that while that has happened, every piece of the pie that's picked up by the point, while uh, a significant fraction uh, uh, of, of this concentration of wealth has happened for the 0.1%, what's intriguing is that um, uh, a significant uh, um, uh, uh, decline we have seen in the bottom 90% of the population in terms of the concentration of wealth. By the way, I should acknowledge this article was written by Matthew Stewart, and it was June 19 of uh, 2018. Um, by skewing, the bottom line here is that by skewing the gains of the new economy to a few, the argument is that the automation will eventually weaken the chief engine of economic growth, which is the middle class. Uh, U.S. economy has produced more than, a, has produced essentially more than a third today than it did in 1998 and the same, with the same size labor force and significantly larger population. So the economic impact, if you believe that there is this inequality that's created and in fact a segment of our population is benefiting for all the good reasons, it's the educated class and it's benefiting from uh, uh, the advances that we seen in technology and the growth of the economy, but there are significant social and economic impact of technology and potentially globalization that has come with it. And it's led to essentially to economic opportunity gap that a, a, section, a, a fraction of our uh, population is experiencing. Uh, others have referred to it as hollowing of the middle class since the 1980s and it has had significant social and economic impact. For example, uh, uh, some of those include the new jobs overwhelmingly that are clustered in cities with skilled population. Uh, there has been uh, a significant impact on intergenerational upward mobility, disproportionate impact on health and emotional well-being that's been documented, not to mention a um, uh, uh, potential cause of some of the political polarization, identity politic, and cognitive segregation that we have seen that's fueled by lack of essentially adequate political response uh, to this inequality. Uh, so I'm not just trying to get you depressed. I'm trying to <laughs> get to essentially the source of this. 
and talk about the potential impact of it, of course, on um, higher ed. Um, a recent book that I looked at, and I highly, highly, I read that I highly recommend, is a book by an Oxford historian economist, um, Carl Fry, uh, and it's a comprehensive, insightful analysis of the relationship between technological advances and work from pre-industrial society all the way through computer revolution and potential, essentially, uh, 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 insight into what might happen in the next two, three decades moving forward. From the argument here is that from the Industrial Revolution to the age of artificial intelligence, this book essentially looks at the history of technological progress, how it has radically shifted the distribution of economic and political power among society members. What Carl Frey argues is that Industrial Revolution created unprecedented wealth and prosperity over time. Over the short period of time, however, it had significant uh, impact on uh, a large segment of the population because of mechanization. But over time, the wealth and the prosperity that was created brought a lot of people into the middle class. So while initially some middle class jobs withered and wages stagnated uh, and potential impact on labor share of uh, profit and, and income, over time, all of that worked out. And over time, what has happened as a result of essentially a number of jobs, essentially significant amount of jobs being created through mechanization and industrialization, there was a rise, a huge rise in the middle class. Um, but the argument that Carl Fry makes, which I think is important, is that what we have seen in the first three quarters of the 20th century is not repeating itself over the last 40, 50 years. And let me explain what I mean by that. The argument is that for the first three quarters of the 20th century, industrialization and automation meant incorporation of working people into a, broad, a broader and growing middle class in society, as I mentioned. Uh, a flow of enabling technology essentially pulled people into new and better paying jobs across American cities in the second industrial revolution. Uh, the clear overlap between essentially <clears throat> blue collar and white collar ambitions and their independencies, interdependencies in this shared prosperity uh, that they enjoy. And in fact, this became the social contract, if you will, for the 20th century. Um, the data shows that we may have seen a reversal of that trend since the dawn of uh, computer age in the 1970s. As we saw, our, uh, information technology, robots, and automation essentially started eroding the middle class and uh, the factory jobs that were created and middle class office jobs that have been created during the first three quarters of the century. So the question is, and by the way, there are a number of exceptions, and Pittsburgh, as it turns out, turns out to be one of those exceptions, and I'm happy to talk about that, at least in the current age. Uh, the question is, given that context, and if you believe the data and if you believe essentially this, this conjecture, uh, where do we go from here and what's the impact on uh, higher ed? <coughs> um, the issue of where we'd go from here can really be teased out by looking at the employment prospects for middle class that hinges on what computers can and cannot do essentially evolving division of labor between man and machine. Technological advances that we see in machine learning and computer vision and robotics and broadly speaking AI and so on, we can see that there are going to be incredible advances that we are going to see in all sectors of our economy. And in fact, if you look at some of these advances, there's no question some of the uh, original uh, uh, thesis uh, that we had about what computers can and cannot do has been definitely uh, shattered. The race between labor enabling and labor replacing technology, in fact, will define what the new next few week, uh, new decades are going to look. And in fact, the long-term benefit to society will depend on what the short term, how we manage the short term. So I don't think that I would dispute that in a long run, 
the benefit from the technology is going to be enormous. The question is, how do we manage that in the short term? And when I say the short term, I don't mean over the next two or three years. We're really talking about over the next decade to two, two decades, if you will. Um, <clears throat> so uh, these trends will likely accelerate rising essentially skill requirements and put more value on workers with specialist skills and in-person service jobs that are going to require more complex social interactions. Potentially ensuring that the gains from the new technologies and economic growth is going to be again concentrated in a segment of society with higher skills and it's not going to be broadly shared. So what can be done? There are a lot of things that can be done and the the purpose of the rest of this talk is not to focus on what can be done broadly. Clearly, government can assume a much wider role, responsibility for social cost of technological change. You can, we can double down on research and investment and development. We can double down on various kinds of policies, including tax policies, housing, zoning policies, that uh, regulation, uh, human capital development, and so on and so on. And of course, we can have significant investment in education and reform of the education. The rest of this talk, what I hope to do in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I think we started a little bit late, is really to talk about uh, the impact of that education and the role of higher ed, particularly uh, uh, in, in dealing and mitigating the changes and the, and the impact that we're going to have on society. Um, I believe that society and its infrastructure, including education, must adapt to this new paradigm. In fact, if you think about the last 100 plus years of education in this country, throughout our history, every period of significant technological change has been met with significant, essentially with a corresponding of wave of innovation in education. And in fact, the pace of the fourth industrial revolution, what we're living through today, makes the need for sweeping transformation of higher education even more urgent. And in order to ensure that education continues to serve as a force for good, an engine of opportunity, our system of education should become, sh must be so dynamic and adaptable as these technologies around us are imp having impact on uh, the rest of economy. Uh, it's imperative that we evolve from an industrial transactional model of education based on much more traditional and rigid views of disciplines to a much more uh, personalized and outcome-based uh, model of education. Now, I'm going to come back, and I promise you, before the talk is over, give you some concrete sort of ideas in the different solution spaces when it comes to the education. But before I get there, I want to spend a couple of minutes on three trends that are drivers of the change in higher education in this global context that I just talked about. There are many, many other, as uh, the leadership of this university can attest to, many other drivers or trends or headwinds that face higher education. But I want to focus on these three in particular in the context of higher ed um, at the moment. First has to do with college affordability and access. This is one of the major headwinds that in fact is exacerbating the issues that I just raised about opportunity gap. I think everyone recognizes that the runaway cost of education are why so many middle class Americans believe uh, are worried about essentially the future of their children and raising essentially some skepticism about the value of a college degree, whether it's worth the expense. And we know this and we hear this today. A Couple of data points. Aggregate student debt has tripled since 2006, in less than 15 years, from $500 million to $1.5 trillion. And every time I give this talk, it's going up by $100 million. And I don't think that's my fault, but in fact, it's larger than the nation's entire credit card debt. Think about that for a moment. College tuition has risen by 538% comparing to price, consumer price index increase of just 121%. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But 
it's important to recognize, again, the context. Similarly, the percentage of high school graduates enrolled in two to two four-year colleges by October, immediately following high school uh, completion, you see that it's been fairly level and it's been, has had a lot of uh, sort of small gyrations, but you see what it is for people in lower economic tier has been decidedly below and there's some positive sort of uh, changes that we see. I can't talk about the cost of education without also talking about the investment that the federal government has made in research and education over the last uh, 75 years, especially since World War II. I'm going to get off the subject, uh, get off on this track for a second, off my script for a second. If you think about what has happened in our nation over the past 75 years, it's undeniable that the investments that we've made in research and education has paid rich dividends to the entire country over that period. In fact, one can attribute the prosperity that we've enjoyed as a nation to that investment that has made by the federal government over that period. But when you look at the data, you'll see that in fact, as percentage of our uh, GDP, the investment in federal R&D is declining, and it actually has been declining for decades, interestingly enough. And right at the time when the rest of the world has figured out that investment in research, in education, and innovation is a ticket to prosperity, is not the time for us to take our foot off the gas. So this is another very important trend that I think is facing academia that we need to consider as we think about uh, the future of economy. The second driver of the change that I want to talk about has to do with skill gap, and I want to just share with you a couple of data points to highlight that. Um, this other data point is driving the urgency of the conversation today uh, uh, about the importance of a college degree. For at least two decades, almost three decades, I should say, what we're seeing is that in, in terms of uh, supply of college graduate and the demand for the college graduates has uh, been widening. In other words, we're not supplying as many college graduates as there are demands for the college graduates. In fact, for much of the 20th century, the supply of college graduates has not only kept up with the demand, but for the past three decades, in fact, uh, has been falling behind significantly, and that, that is expected to grow over time. And in fact, when you look at the skill gap, think about all the jobs that have been created uh, in, in the new economy that even over the last uh, you know, 10 years, 11 years, we would not have thought about these jobs, as, such as big data architects, social media manager. This is actually based on a LinkedIn study that was done examining more than 250 million, uh, essentially, members and their occupation. In fact, today's most popular job titles were nowhere to be found even 10 or 15 years ago. The final point that I want to make about the skill gap actually has to do with computing. Uh, we need to be mindful of that there's a growing demand on individuals who have computational skills, data intensive skills, and I don't mean just computer science degrees. I mean individuals who have, uh, uh, again, uh, ability to uh, do problem solving using computational skills and data intensive skills. And I'm sure you've seen this data that while we have seen a significant increase in the number of majors, this is based on the Talby data, the number of faculty members that we have, whether it's teaching faculty or tenure track faculty across the country, and again based on the survey data, is not keeping up with the essentially the demand. By the way, what that demand does not show is something that you're also experiencing at Rice, the demand isn't just because of the CS majors, it's also because everybody else on campus who needs to learn about computational, uh, essentially, algorithms and computational thinking and data intensive approaches. All right, let me pick up the speed just a little bit. Um, the last trend that I want to talk about has to do with the future of work, and in particular, the evolution of that. I hope at least at the beginning of the talk, I, I uh, uh, highlighted to you how the nature of work is changing. But I want to just share with you a couple of data points. Uh, one of the interesting data points that I saw was that 65% of the students who are entering elementary school today 
will work one day in jobs that do not exist today. Think about it. The fundamental question becomes then for us, what do we teach the students? An 18-year-old who comes as a freshman to Carnegie Mellon or Rice, what do we teach them such that they're prepared for jobs in the next 40 to 50 years? And it's not an exaggeration to believe that, in fact, uh, a student who graduates from here in the next three, four years is going to be in the uh, job market for the next 40, 50 years. So how do we prepare the next generation so they're, re they're ready for these jobs that have not been invented yet? There are also two other drivers that are uh, impacting the future of work. One, of course, has to do with autonomy and the digital revolution, and I've talked about this already. But one of the important data points that's showing up is that the belief is that almost half of the US jobs are going to be at risk of being taken over by com computers and automation within the next 20 years, according to a study done by Oxford University researchers. Again, think of it in terms of people who are in the job uh, force, in the workforce today, and in the next 20 years, half of those jobs are going to be potentially at some level automated. The other driving force for this change in the nature of work that we see has to do with the gig economy. And this data, to be candid, even surprised me. That, first of all, the concept of nine to five jobs and a 40-hour 40 work, 40 work week is actually rapidly being reshaped by technology-enabled and on-demand independent work uh, that could be done anywhere at any time, the gig economy. In 2016, two noted economists, uh, found that um, Lawrence Katz and Alan Kruger found that all employment growth in the United States since 2005 through 2016 have been to a large extent due to alternative work. The offline contract essentially uh, that is offline and it's a contract uh, workers and freelance workers. Also, a McKinsey study estimated that 20 to 30 percent of the working population in the U.S. and Europe is engaged in independent work. Again, the impact of this is that when we think about the future of education, we need to think about self-directed education, we need to think about lifelong learning, and we also need to be thinking of entrepreneurship as a foundational skill for the future workforce. Now, with all of that, the question before us is how do we prepare our students for a changing working pla workplace and a changing workforce? As I mentioned um, earlier, at every stage of technological change, U.S. has seen major innovations in education. And without any doubt, I believe that we're at the cusp of a new, the need for a new wave of innovation that potentially will transform higher education in this country. So, in the remaining uh, minutes that I have, I would like to talk about uh, the solution spaces. In fact, there are several broad areas where we can find solution to the challenges facing higher ed with the context that I've given you. Let me just jump into each of them and, and talk about a couple of ideas within each concept and then I'll open it up to questions. The first solution space has to do with how we need to reimagine curriculum to both enhance digital core competencies and incorporate human skills. I think everyone understands the outlook for STEM jobs are out there. So I'm not here to stand here and say, well, everybody needs to study STEMs, and that's where the jobs are going to be. So we just need to educate some significant number of essentially students who are going to be. Uh, graduating with STEM degrees. In fact, if you tease that out, you'll see that, in fact, there's a massive concentration of that in areas having to do with engineering and in computational skills. There have been a, a number of studies done, two of these that are mentioned here. In fact, uh, Moshe has been involved in a couple of these as well, that there is broad agreement that we need to broaden participation in computing and STEM but in particular providing essentially digital competencies, computational skills, and, uh, uh, and skills that have to do with uh, intensive data analysis uh, to our students. And in fact, the position that we have taken is that that's not just for STEM students, it has to be for everyone. Whether you're studying psychology, you're studying humanities, you're studying other areas of social science, computational skills, data intensive skills, 
are going to be extremely important to that education, which means re really rethinking the curriculum in the context of providing those uh, digital competencies. But the tr truth is, uh, STEM is only one part of the picture. In fact, as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, a student that comes to Rice or Carnegie Mellon this year will graduate in four years, is going to be in the job and the workforce for the next 40, 50 years. So the question is, how do we prepare the students for that lifetime of success and, and uh, being in a workforce? We know that we don't know what the jobs of the future are going to look like. But one thing that's undeniable is that a liberal art education will have to be uh, core to education of future students. In fact, we have to consider that these human skills would include teamwork and collaboration, includes communication, includes leadership, includes problem solving, critical thinking, organizational skills, creativity has to become part of education. So again, the position that we have taken is that while it's important to have those digital competencies and computational skills and data intensive skills, it's just as important also for students who are studying STEM to have these called so-called human skills. When it's collaboration, when it's communication skills, problem solving and so on, has to be part of that. I would be remiss if I didn't say that while we're seeing these advances in technology, how they're transforming every sector of our economy and potential impact of our society, we also need to find ways to expand the conversation within our curriculum, integrate with our curriculum, to include the discussion of critical inter intersection between ethics and technology, between privacy and technology, and, and of course, involving uh, uh, issues that address policy issues and technology that has to be integrated into our uh, educational programs. So that is uh, one aspect of reimagining the curriculum. The other aspect of it that I want to highlight is uh, we probably need to rethink disciplinary silos. If the future is going to require us to solve problems by bringing interdisciplinary teams together, uh, the disciplinary silos and the department boundaries may need to become much, much more porous. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need to get rid of departments and colleges. Certainly, I'm not going to say that being taped on video. But, uh, <laughs> but more seriously, uh, we need to be thinking whether the current structure of the universities and the current the way that we have organized universities and disciplines uh, serves us in a, in a long run. To give you an anecdotal evidence of that, every time at Carnegie Mellon we have introduced programs that, I'm just going to focus on the undergraduate because we understand that at the research it's absolutely true, but even at the undergraduate level, every time we've introduced programs that cuts across disciplines, focuses on these new intellectual hubs that are being developed, the response from our students and response from those who employ our students has been enormous. To give you an example, ID8 is a undergraduate minor that we develop that focuses on the intersection of arts, media, technology, and design. We launched it about three years ago, and what we saw that out of 7,000 undergraduate, almost 1,000 of them are taking ID8 courses from four colleges, from 35 faculty members across the university. And it has actually in created an intellectual core around this. Another example is our neuroscience, and I was discussing this with a, n a number of colleagues earlier today, where when we look at essentially neuroscience, it is, as, as it is on your campus, it involves our cognitive uh, uh, psychology colleagues, it includes our biology and neurobiology faculty, it includes our computational biology and computer science faculty, it includes engineering, and biomedical engineering faculty, and it has become inherently interdisciplinary program, such that an undergraduate that comes in could have a concentration in cognitive neuroscience, it could have a concentration in neurobiology, or have a concentration in uh, computational neuroscience. And I firmly believe that as we move forward, examples like this are going to be much, much more common, not just within the research enterprise of the university, but equally important at the 
education level, particularly at the undergraduate level. Again, at the risk of running over, let me uh, talk about the second uh, pillar of solution space. We perhaps need to th rethink structure and pedagogy moving away from uh, the transactional nature of education. And this is somewhat provocative. In fact, uh, not only we need to look at experimentation assessment and scaling and eventual concept consolidation of new educational models and structure. And I know, in fact, oh, every one of our peer institutions is experimenting with that, including uh, this great institution. We also need to be embracing uh, the notion of learning as a lifelong endeavor. Um, we could be potentially rethinking the relevance of a four-year degree, uh, a focus on outcome and competencies, not necessarily the transactional model of a student coming and graduating in four years might be something that we should be thinking about uh, that could be used to drive essentially incentives and creating um, sta uh, new standards. Um, and a related concept to that is providing essentially appropriate level of incentives such that lifelong learning becomes very much uh, deeply uh, ingrained in the culture of our society. And, and the other concept has to do with closing the opportunity gap. New strategies for providing access to underserved communities and strategies for enriching student success and persistence. Because if you really believe that there is a debt crisis for student debt in this country, the best thing we can do is also to make sure the students that come to our universities and colleges, and I know persistence at places like Rice and CMU is amazing. It's, it's very high. We spend tremendous amount of resources to make that happen. But that actually is not nationally the case. And in fact, spending a lot more resources on the student success is going to be important. The related topic to that is, while this may not directly apply to four-year universities, especially R1 research universities, we need to be considering multiple pathways to success, particularly vocational training and learning uh, by doing. Folks, I really believe that the notion that uh, every kid needs to go to college to get a four-year degree, and that is the only path to success, is very much of an outdated uh, notion. If you think about it, even today, only 35% of our population, young adults, actually get a four-year degree. So if you believe that, in fact, automation is going to exacerbate this skill bias that we have experiencing for the past 50 years, what that means is we're going to have to create new pathways such that students come into an educational program that they don't necessarily get a four-year degree, but will be able to enter the job market and more importantly, be able to enter the, the middle class. Now, I'm not suggesting that people shouldn't get a four-year degree, far from it. We should do everything we can to provide access to all the students who want to go to college, but we also have to be cognizant of the fact that not everyone is going to do it. And finally, an important point related to that is that increasingly we need to worry about the role of community colleges in vocational training and technical um, training. And, and an issue related to that is the role of technology enhanced learning as a disruptive innovation. Of course, the motivation for this has been desire to control costs and increase access, desire for personalization, and desire for better learning outcomes. I know that you also have ex uh, experimented with MOOCs. The grand challenge, if you think about it, uh, is not about, oh, just reducing cost. The grand challenge of education is each student has a dedicated teacher personalized learning at a marginal cost. And that can actually be done, I hope, I'm an eternal optimist, using technology. And that would be the role of technology that uh, would be quite uh, disruptive. I, had, I wish I had more time. I'm happy to take that particular topic offline with you. Finally, the third uh, place in the solution space has to do with new models of engagement for private sector and government policies. Let me make a, one broad statement. Um, universities are playing an increasingly important role in economic development. And 
catalyzing regional and national growth because of the innovations that happens on our campuses. So without really putting that on a slide, let me state that without any doubt, we need to be rethinking our relationship with the private sector. In fact, even our relationship with our faculty members, how flexible we are in terms of our faculty members' interest within this broader context of uh, uh, innovation ecosystem that we live in. So that's an important topic that I think is going to face a lot of universities. But the point I'm making here about new models of engagement for the private sector really has to do with human capital development. Instead of giving you, going through this, um, I know that you'll have access to these slides, instead of list of all these ideas and concepts that, by the way, they're not mine, these are things that have been discussed uh, nationally, let me just make an a, a, a important observation here. In this country, our entire tax structure is to support capital investment. What it needs to do is to change and to support human capital investment. That is the most important thing we can do to prepare the next generation and in fact really take a serious, serious uh, attempt and dealing with this reskilling and upskilling that we need to do. So we need to rethink human capital investment as a long-term investment and provide incentives for private sector to in fact invest in that. Imagine if a company comes and pays for somebody to go to college and after they finish they can just go somewhere else and work somewhere else. What is an incentive for a company to pay for someone to go to college or what's an incentive for a company to do upskilling or reskilling of the existing employees? We have to make sure that we provide the right level of incentives for that to happen. And uh, in fact that would mean tax incentives and fiscal policies for investing in human capital, including reskilling and upskilling, as I mentioned. Um, uh, you know, expanding work sharing program to provide flexibility for lifelong learners. In fact, offering creative options even for financial aid, such as the income sharing agreements that have been considered. And I want to leave you with one more uh, idea. Perhaps it's long overdue for us as a nation to think about universal national service as a concept, an initiative that would provide training and essential skills for those who are uh, headed to college, uh, not only headed to college, or financial support for individuals who are also uh, college bound. So in other words, think about it as a national service to support those who want to go to college, get a four-year degree, or those who want to get certain competencies and skills to be able to uh, thrive in, in the new economy. And now we come to my final slide, just to wrap. In 1840, uh, education pioneer Horace uh, Mann said, education beyond all other devices of human origin is the great equalizer and the wheel balance, the balance wheel of the social machinery. Uh, indeed, higher education is unique in its power to catalyze uh, social mobility. We have seen this in this country over the last hundred years. It can bridge social, economic, and racial uh, geographical divide, not unlike any other force. Higher education has a unique role in ensuring that new technological breakthroughs make society better for everyone, with shared prosperity for everyone. But if we want education to continue to be an active force for equality, and not an inadvertent engine for inequality, we need to commit ourselves to an urgent action to rethink higher education in this country, which means unbounded partnership across organizations and disciplines, continuous innovation and new models, and lifelong learning as a guiding principle. Thank you again for giving me the platform to share my thoughts with you. Thank you.